Hi, Turf TV's here today in Ipswich visiting Ransom's Jacobson. Uh, we're going to meet Alan Prickett, their MD, and find out a bit about him and the business. Well, Alan, thank you very much for your time today. Um, I guess a, a sensible place to start is to, for you to tell us a little bit about your background uh, before taking on the role that you're currently holding here. Yeah, it's an interesting journey, really. Um, I trained in agricultural engineering originally, having worked on a farm in my teens and really enjoyed the whole agricultural and machinery piece. So had every intention in my early career of getting into ag engineering. Um, I was very fortunate actually to be offered a job at uh, a company called PA Turney in Oxfordshire shortly after leaving college where I started off uh, in the workshops um, using my engineering training but then quite quickly decided that it wasn't really going to work for me as a career and I was offered a position um, at that time working in the mower sales department under, under a guy called Mick Miller who has been a great mentor to me. Um, gradually moved into the professional um, product sales with Ransoms um, so found I really enjoyed working in the varied customer base that we had, the, the schools, the country houses, the equine places, football clubs and so on and you know a lot of bowling clubs in those days as well so I really enjoyed the the grass machinery market um, and just moved more and more into the professional side, so the councils and contractors and golf courses. Um, then uh, uh, around 1996 I was approached by Jacobson uh, as a potential regional manager uh, there uh, when Jacobson was based at Kettering and I uh, worked a territory which the company president here, David Withers, had worked previously so we, we kind of flip-flopped. He moved into international accounts and I took over his territory for Jacobson and really went from there. Uh, the acquisition of Ransoms by Textron happened in uh, 1998 so almost as soon as I joined Jacobson a couple of years in I was back into the ransoms fold again, selling <laughs> ransoms, so there's been a bit of a recurring theme there. Um, uh, then my career at ransoms went from managing the same region and then a little bit of expansion of that until 2001 when I was given the chance to go and set up three company branches in uh, Salby, Mansfield and Redditch uh, to take over some previous dealer territories there, set those branches up, employed all the people, fascinating. Um, job really, got them all up and running and then we uh, transitioned those back to dealer, dealer management um, in about 2003 at which point I was offered the job of UK sales manager, S took that job, ran with it, um, then more movement occurred and I was offered sales director, then did that for seven years, uh, uh, then it was time to move people around and give us all a bit of a, a refresh again and I was lucky enough to be sent down as managing director of our Asia Pacific region uh, where I was for the last three years prior to this January um, and then made managing director of the, of the company at that point. So, um, Did you find that an easy decision to move to Singapore? Uh, not particularly. It was a, It's always a big decision to up your up roots with your three children and wife and move to the other side of the world and I hadn't spent a lot of time in Asia at that point but it was a great it was a great personal opportunity for me to go and learn something completely new and I did enjoy it and for the for the children it's you know, just a wonderful experience broadening their international uh, connections they've got friends from all over the world now uh, it's made them so culturally adaptable it's almost unbelievable. They were in a school with 77 other, other nationalities in, in Singapore and got so much out of travelling around there. We learned to scuba dive down there and did a lot of that. We've seen some amazing things. So with hindsight, best decision I ever made, but it was a difficult one to take in the first place. It always will be with a family involved. It's not, <laughs> not, yeah. not an easy thing to just up sticks, is it? But I, I think the important thing about what I've just described to you about career is it does absolutely validate the the policy within Textron and previously within Ransoms actually where you could wherever you can possibly do it you promote people within the business you move people through the business and you challenge them and you keep them fresh and you know each time I moved and each time David Withers moved who is now the president and he's worked up from regional manager at Jacobson as well so that's a 
you know, becoming a president of an American company, having been a regional manager for a, a relatively small business in the UK, is, is, is pretty good. They do believe in internal promotion and career paths. Well, it's a great way to attract good people and also keep good people on board if it, it is demonstrated that they can actually really genuinely progress. It really is. And, and the, the, the best thing about that is you, you then create a vacuum at the bottom of the business where you pull in talented young yeah. people, graduates, we're, we're very focused on, on university graduates these days, pulling them into the business and developing them from scratch straight out of university so they, 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 they grow in the company culture and then you, you build up a pipeline. And uh, I think it's something that we're very proud of actually is the way we are able to develop good people within, within the company. You don't have to leave this company to get on in, in your career. Um, so again, rolling forward then, we, we got a, as far as you going down to Asia Pacific, Singapore I think it is in uh, 2011. Um, the lessons you've learned out of that and then brought back to, to the role you've got now, I mean, how has that really benefited not just you as an individual, uh, but the company and the lessons it's learned? A Asia Pacific had been uh, somewhat between two camps for a long time. So. The, 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 the biggest lesson I learned going down there was what can happen if a territory isn't really included inclusively within a business when it comes to planning and management of marketing and that sort of stuff. What had happened down there um, was that the brand had been quite badly knocked about by lack of exposure. So we'd, we'd been doing all the operational stuff. We'd got good technical people down there. We got sales guys down there. Not enough sales guys to support the potential number of customers down there. Um, as, as MD of Asia Pacific, I had about 6,200 golf courses in my, in my portfolio, if you like. And when I went down there, I had two salesmen and two techs and to put that in context that's the, that's the same number of golf courses that that we have in 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 Europe um, I don't include I, you know, you know EMEA yep. constitutes about the same number of golf courses you have got one block where I've got a lot of people a lot <laughs> an APAC with the same number of courses with very few. So the first thing really that came to mind was the brand needs rebuilding. So we invested quite a lot of money in uh, show support, uh, field days, advertising, associations and all that good stuff. Sort of marketing 101 but it just needed doing. And we brought some more people in and we, we increased the number of people we got down there to, to do a, a better job of managing the business. But it is, it is, it is vastly more difficult than managing this territory because the courses are a lot further apart and the, the, the money is being spent by a relatively small proportion of high-end courses. There's an awful lot of courses out there which are very hard to get to, uh, ex-military courses in Myanmar for example, um, military courses in India. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of customers it's hard to get to and the distances between some of the courses in, in Vietnam are breathtaking. You, 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 can go out and you can go out to visit a couple of golf courses and you can find yourself taking a flight to get from one to the other. Um, so it's huge. Asia Pacific is a huge territory. So with all of that to do, how do you actually cope with uh, you know, all those plates that you've got to spin at the moment? <laughs> By having other people do the work. <laughs> so we've got, we've, got, we, we've got managers for each of those territories senior managers and then we've got uh, technical support working under under them based in the regions we've got sales staff based in the regions so it's my job frankly now is more to do with keeping an eye on things making sure that company policies are followed and, and, and setting things like budgets and keeping keeping a management handle on it but the but the work is frankly done by the people in those territories so within your remit, your territories, where are the particular areas that you think you know, are ripe for growth and could be you know, important to, to your business over the next few years? The, the, well, the, re the, recovering, uh, the recovering countries in, in Europe, for a start, you know, massive market in Spain, Portugal, uh, good market in Italy, those economies as they, as they come out of recession will resume being big opportunities for us. But that's more of a recovery 
trajectory we're talking about there on on the the big the, well, the big opportunities for growth really are still in Asia. There's, there's still a lot of new golf being built in Asia. Um, but as I said before, it's not that easy to get to some of it. it it's not an easy market to mine for, for opportunities. But there are the, the, the Southeast Asia countries are certainly still a big opportunity. Japan is the same size virtually as the UK in terms of the number of golf courses. So Japan is a, a steady big market for us but it's not growing particularly same with same with South Korea China was the big opportunity but until the government take the brakes off again that that's going to be it's going to be significant but not as significant as, as, it, as it has been in the past it's 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 slowed right down so what we call the new tiger economies the Vietnam's Cambodia Myanmar those sort of places are probably the biggest growth we're able to tap into at the moment. If we can move on and just talk about product development, which is the lifeblood of, of any you know, manufacturing business, particularly, I guess, when you're, you're up against some, such strong competition as you are. Um, one of the recent products that we've seen come out is the, the MP series. Um, what impressed me about that particularly was the fact that it was been designed and developed in the UK and uh, from the ground up, I think. Can you tell us a little bit about that product? Yeah, we're, we're, we're very very proud of that one. Um, Rightly so, I think. Yeah, we do, we do build product, design product from here, from, from scratch. Um, typically, we would be the lead, the lead factory for the municipal range. We do, we do design and build golf products here as well, but we, we take a leadership position on the, on the Muni stuff. Uh, the MP series is a, a successful attempt to build a platform. It's a, a municipal medium platform and the, uh, the beauty of that is from a manufacturer's standpoint we've got a much, a much clearer supply chain. We will use the same basic platform to build a batwing rotary which is the MP you've seen already. Um, in three width variants we'll, we'll, we'll go on to build an out front and cylinder variations of that and down the track a flail variation. So we do have a, um, a platform now that we can expand and that platform from a, from a customer perspective it's obviously more efficient from a manufacturing supply chain st standpoint and it makes it easier for us to, to supply the spares efficiently for it because we don't have to stock so many different parts. From, from an end user standpoint that machine will will, if he's running um, a fleet of, say, cylinder and rotary products, limits the number of parts he has to hold in stock um, and means that the supply and the training of the mechanics and everything else is also much easier because we're working from a common platform. So we're, we're very excited about that. It also uses some new technologies, um, both control technologies and some of the materials that are used in the manufacturer of the MP are state-of-the-art, reduces weight, increases strength, increases the, the flexibility the, the, the operator has to control the machine in different scenarios. So um, a, a real leap forward for us and we're so far very, very pleased with it. Well that's one area you've obviously invested in which indicates it's an area that you feel is a growth sector or at least not, not a declining sector necessarily. Yeah. Um, are there other areas in the UK market in particular I, I guess that we'd be interested in finding out about that are either in decline or you feel are growing? And I'm talking market wide rather than... I, I, I don't know about de declining and growing markets. The, the, the golf market is fairly flat in terms of, in terms of growth. Uh, the, 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 the big challenge in the municipal and contract sector has been the, the, the um, austerity measures that have been brought in in most countries in Europe now where grass is being cut less often. People will be cutting typically longer grass, different quality grass than they have in the past, which means in some cases more horsepower are needed, different cutting mechanisms are needed. And one of the reasons we have to reinvent these products, and we can't just keep selling the old stuff that works perfectly well, you know, we've got to reinvigorate things, is because people are looking for different, different triggers for their, their new, or different solutions for their new uh, challenges. So high road speed, for example. Um, some countries use trailers, some countries run their mowers on the, on the road. We want those machines to be able to run quicker, more efficiently, we need plenty of fuel so they can stay out all day without refueling. We need the ability to cut grass less often 
but still cut it neatly and efficiently. So it's not so much the market size changing, it's the opportunity that we can create to take share from our competitors by bringing in more innovative products to cope with today's challenges, which are different than they were five years ago. Um, the national contractors are having to rethink the way they do the work because the money's being split differently. We have to listen to our customers and we're, we're, not, really, we're not really selling machines, we're selling solutions. And as long as we remember that, when we're developing products, they'll be successful. It's no good just developing a product because it looks good on paper and because we can. We have to listen to what people are telling us about their challenges and we need to find ways of overcoming them. And I think the, I think the new MP is actually our, our best effort for a long time in terms of moving forward using current technology to address current issues which are constantly changing because of this funding issue that's going on. Moving on to another issue that has been big throughout my time in looking at this sector, and that's you know, 10 years now, um, it's always been an issue, the trade show debate, the great trade show debate we could call it. Um, we've had some news over the last few weeks that Saltex is going to change the way it's, it's operating. It's moving away from Windsor and it's moving its time slot from September, so it's now going to be at the NEC in November. Um, do you have any thoughts that you want to share with us on that? Well, lots of thoughts. <laughs> um, I think the IOG have probably done the right thing in, in terms of moving to an indoor venue slightly later in the, in the year. Uh, Soltex has always been an enjoyable event and I think over the years we've been relatively lucky with the weather but as I'm sure you know when it does rain there it gets pretty unpleasant. Difficult, and, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it, it would seem like a good idea. The, the Harrogate and Soltex shows are the two big opportunities for all of us to, to showcase new products. They've really morphed over the years into a north and south show as far as a lot of people are concerned. So it's rare to see a lot of people from the deep south travelling up to the to the Harrogate show and equally you don't see that, or I don't think we see that many people from the extreme north coming down to coming down to Soltex. So the move to the NEC might well be regionally easier. Um, I think the costs will be a challenge. The NEC I think is going to be a, a, a more expensive proposition than, than Soltex. We'll just have to wait and see. We, we, we will support it um, and we'll just have to see how the first year goes. It's obviously going to have to be a very different show, not least by the fact it's it's inside, and I think uh, that will put limitations on what people will do with their space and perhaps become a little bit more creative, uh, and maybe yeah. we'll see some, some innovation in a different way there. Yeah. But you know, personally, we feel, or I feel, um, the industry needs good trade events because there are lots and lots of different ways for people to get uh, information these days, including turf business and the, the opportunities we give people, but there's nothing quite like people getting face to face, talking to one another, and, and sharing experiences. Yeah, and, and 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 frankly, the networking opportunity that these shows provide is more important to us than the ability to put pieces of metal on a on a on a show stand. And there are various ways these shows are handled throughout the world. Um, you know, Australia, the AGCSA have a big show one year and a smaller one the following year. They're both good. The, the big show there gives us an opportunity to, to, to showcase product and the small show gives us an opportunity to bring in guest speakers and to sponsor education seminars but still meet the, the customers. That's the, the key thing, being able to go and meet people. So I agree, I think we do need shows. I think we had too many and they were costing us far too much money. And certainly we got into some pretty heavyweight spending on, on the shows. And we're now more considering, as you said, creativity, putting something that's visually eye-catching, not necessarily having four or five Arctic loads of machinery on the, on, on the stand. Well, I guess we'll all see in about a year or so, won't we? So <laughs> that's yeah. that. Um, other issues in the industry, do you, do you feel there are other, and again I'd like to focus on the UK here because that's where our, our audience is, um, what do you think are the key issues facing us over the next year or two? Lack of, lack of money. I think a lot of the people that buy our equipment at the moment, whether they're contractors, councils or golf courses, are struggling with confidence, struggling with revenues. 
whether that's central government revenues or, or, or memberships or food and beverage spend. Um, those are the big those are the big challenges. I don't see any I don't see any great political pressure against golf development. I don't see the kind of challenges we see in other parts of the world with basic stuff like import licenses. I, I, I think it it comes down to economics. Another another challenge all the manufacturers are facing is is tier four and the increasing emissions standards that are coming through and that again is going to impact our customers in terms of the amount of money they have to spend to buy what would have been a, a relatively affordable piece of equipment like a fairway mower and on the larger engine products now the cost of emission compliance is getting quite extreme running into thousands of dollars in some cases so one of the things we think we might see is is almost a, a stepping back from the cutting edge technology we've seen to a more basic technology that you can hang on the back of a tractor or smaller engines powering lighter machines you know when we when we launched the LF100 fairway mower um, back in the 90s it was a it was a lightweight low powered 100 inch fairway mower and those machines have just got bigger and bigger and bigger and the engines have got bigger and everything's just stretched it's still cut fairways, so again, it's it's likely I think that the economic pressures will mean that people aren't prepared to spend the kind of money on a on a full a full blown machine with full tier four final compliance, and they're going to start looking at alternatives, which might mean we we start effectively designing back to more primitive products than we than we've been selling recently. You've been with. Uh Ransoms Jacobson for 17 years now, I believe. In, yeah. in those 17 years, uh, what would you say has been your biggest single standout memory? I think setting up the three branches was the, the that was a really interesting job. That was, that was starting from scratch and setting up effectively three dealerships. Um, it w it wasn't easy, but it was very very interesting, and it w and it was it was that step from regional management to doing that that really put me on a management track here, and uh, I I really enjoyed it. And the other the other standout thing was moving down to Asia. I mean that was a life changing experience. It's uh, living in Asia and living in Singapore gives you a completely different perspective on the world that. I'd, I'd spent a lot of time travelling as sales director here. I'd spent vast amounts of time in the Middle East, across Europe, um, and in the US, but I hadn't spent much time in Asia. And uh, going down there was, was amazing, actually. I'd, I'd recommend anybody that gets the chance to go and work down there to, to take it. It's, it's incredibly interesting from a work standpoint. Lots of challenges, and, and from a personal point of view, it's fascinating. Putting the, the Asia experience to one side perhaps, um, what else or who else has been the biggest single influence on your career to date? I, I think the, the biggest influence on the way I do my job and on the, uh, the, 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 my knowledge of the industry has to be Mick Miller who's sadly no longer with us uh, from, from PA Tourney but he was a great friend and he, he, he really helped me. Um, and back in, the, back in the early days, the sales director here, uh, Guy Catchpole, sales director of Ransoms, was immensely helpful to me in my early career. And, and again, taught me a lot of things that I think have stood me in good stead. Um, and I continue to have a, a very good relationship with David Withers, who I think has done a, our company president, who has done an amazing job working up right through the ranks. There are very few jobs in, in our business that David hasn't done or at least have background knowledge of and uh, I think he's he's done an incredible job really of running each each role he's done as he's gone through the business and now running running the company based in the US and that's quite an achievement actually and, and that's got to be very good for staff morale and attracting people I mean, people obviously yeah. can see that that genuinely is a, a career development within the same company rather than having to you know chop and change companies to get that career progression which so many people have to do yeah I, I believe that's the case and if you look at our sales director Rupert Price he's again he, he joined straight out of university he's he's worked in Europe in sales he's worked as commercial manager here he's worked in UK sales 
sales director, UK sales manager, sales director, and people that work for him, various other people within other departments have worked their way through the business and are now in senior roles. And it does mean that in our business we've got hundreds of years of institutional knowledge amongst the people that are running departments and in the, in the very important people that work in the factory. You know, they're, they're, I'm signing 40-year awards, 45-year awards almost every week in terms of people that have been with the business for their entire working life. We've had first, second and third generations of families working here. And the amount of knowledge those, got, those people have of our business and of what they do is phenomenal. And you know, moving them through the business rather than always bringing in outsiders means that we do, we do have that massive institutional knowledge here. But now we're bringing the youngsters from the universities in to be the next generation who are going to be better educated than any of us are and you know, they're going to have that knowledge of current technologies that, you know, in some cases I don't think I even know what I don't know when it comes to <laughs> technology. But, yeah, some of the stuff that we can do now I didn't even re realise was possible, but a lot of the young people coming through, it's second nature. So we're, we're reinvigorating the company by pulling those through at the bottom and, uh, and offering that career path to the experienced people. You've got both ends covered and that longevity of, of staff retention obviously speaks volumes for any business. So. Um, I've got one final question for you and if you want to duck it because it's too embarrassing, feel free. Um, but I'd just like to ask you, who cuts the grass at home and <laughs> with what? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's pretty much evenly divided by me and Mrs. Prickett, but um, I've got a selection of mowers, so I can answer that in an, in an uncontroversial way. I've got a very complex garden with banks and trees and all sorts of bits and pieces, so I have a, my biggest mower is a Mountfield 21-inch roller drive, I have a hater harrier, which make the guys at Toro happy, <laughs> um, and I've got an Allen Hover mower, so uh, I've spread it around, but uh, unfortunately none of, none of our own products are suitable for the grass at my house. I'd like to use a, a Marquis cylinder mower, but it would be, there's just too many tree roots and too many bits of stone thrown around by the kids and stuff. So uh, yeah, that's what I cut the grass with well, when my you. wife isn't cutting it. Thank you for your honesty there, Alan. <laughs> thank you for your time today. We've taken up quite a bit of it. I better let you get back to spinning some of those plates. And, uh, we'll catch up again with you soon, I hope. Okay, thanks, Martin. Pleasure.